present you. Okay. So uh, we are happy to have with us today, Dr. John Lassen. Dr. Lassen is a senior project manager at Viking Genetics and an adjunct associate professor at Ars University in Denmark. He has been at Vikings Genetics for six years with a focus on developing data for breeding value estimation for efficiency and methane emission in dairy cattle. In general, he is interested in new phenotypes and their genetic analysis, with the main driver always being the application for dairy farms. We appreciate you being here today with us, and I'll pass it to you now. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to give this presentation for you uh, people in Canada. Uh, I uh, I'm so uh, fortunate to be part of uh, collaboration with uh, with people from University of, uh, of Guelph, particularly, but also from other universities through projects, and uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to uh, to have meetings with you, and and uh, and I really hope we can uh, continue to have a good collaboration in the future. So uh, no doubt in uh, in giving this presentation uh, for you here. Uh, yes, my name is Jan Lassen, and uh, and I have been working with this uh, 3D uh, camera-based measurements uh, to do uh, feed intake records and body weight measurements uh, in a commercial setting, but I have not done it alone. Uh, and uh, Jan uh, Rento Mason and Søren Borgersen, uh, which are the uh, co-authors of, of this presentation here, they have not done it alone. Uh, we, the three of us, have not done it alone either, uh, but, uh, but we have uh, been uh, some of the key uh, partners uh, from Viking Genetics in order to do it. Viking Genetics, that is a Nordic uh, AI company uh, in Denmark, Sweden and Finland, and we cover uh, both a Holstein breeding program, a Jersey breeding program, a red dairy cow program, but also uh, crosses and also uh, more and more beef uh, bulls, a beef program uh, to, to meet the market requirements of uh, beef on uh, dairy uh, crosses. Uh, we uh, we're very much uh, working with this uh, 3D camera-based system. Uh, we call it CFIT, uh, cattle feed intake, and and the abbreviation CFIT uh, is uh, is also to indicate that if we know something about feed intake, we should also be able to say something about a fit cow. Uh, there are some key elements in the CFIT system, and that is to identify uh, the cows uh, individually. It is to uh, predict or uh, estimate the feed intake per cow per day. But if we want to go into the complexity around uh, feed efficiency, we also need to know something about the body weight of the cow. And these uh, three key uh, are key elements uh, in uh, the things that we want to use the data for. That is to uh, do breeding value estimation based on this data, but also uh, all the traits we do breeding value estimation for, uh, they also, the data that comes for that, has to be able to be used for management on farm and and that is key also for this uh, and i'll that is something that i'll focus a lot on in the second half of this presentation here how can you use the data for management on farm uh, in uh, in ways uh, the, the the political uh, how the political uh, landscape look this this uh, in the period we're in now, uh, the dairy cattle production is very much under pressure, uh, especially on the release of, of climate gases. Uh, and uh, there we also believe that the input we get from CFIT system is something we can use uh, to document uh, initiatives uh, and document the reduction and mitigation strategies uh, that is done on farm. We have something that we really want to, to use the CFIT system for also, in order to say something about uh, cow behavior, especially uh, eating behavior uh, and uh, uh, behavioral structures uh, in the herd, in the group uh, of cows that are walking around eating uh, from this uh, buffet that is put in front of them. We also hope to be able to say something about the relationship between efficiency and health and efficiency and reproduction, but that's not where we are today. Uh, it's something that uh, we want to collaborate with, uh, with partners on also in the future. And then the system is continued uh, under development. Uh, we are really, uh, uh, we're really riding a, uh, we're really riding a, a, a bike right now, where we uh, are putting on the wheels as we are uh, biking on it, uh, and and it's really a, a nice journey. But it's also uh, something that uh, takes a lot of energy and and uh, and is uh, can be frustrating sometimes, but also very giving. Of course, 
feed intake is is interesting uh, due to the economic value for the farmer. If the farmer can reduce uh, feed intake just by a few percentages per year uh, with the same uh, production level, uh, then the farmer will make a lot of money. But it's also related to uh, disease occurrence. We know that disease occurrence is coming often in early lactation, as this uh, graph here shows, uh, where we have numbers uh, of um, numbers of months away from calving on the uh, x-axis, and then the proportion of uh, diseases that are occurring uh, on the y-axis. And and you can see here that. Uh, the majority of the diseases that come in dairy production, uh, they come straight after calving. And and if we many of these diseases are also related to the fact that the cow is in negative energy balance. So if we want to improve uh, this uh, unfortunate situation, uh, we believe that it's necessary to know something about feed intake in early lactation. We also have seen some of the results that has been done on uh, genetic uh, parameter estimation estimation of the correlation between uh, the traits that are part of the complexity uh, inefficiency that these parameters they go uh, very much up and down through lactation and and if this that if if this is the true biology it's of course based on uh, relatively small uh, data samples uh, the the left one from the netherlands and the right one from uh, denmark sweden and finland if this is really uh, true data then uh, we cannot avoid measuring feed intake in early lactation because if we only measure in mid to late lactation, then what we'll do is more or less that we will uh, make the feed intake in early lactation uh, even worse. Uh, and that is definitely not what we want to achieve uh, doing breeding value estimation. So the CFID system has been running for uh, some years and the data uh, that we generate from the system uh, is already used in the uh, index that we uh, that we uh, report in uh, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland, and and we call the index for safe feed, and the safe feed index uh, contains two parts. One part is the maintenance. So if a cow weighs 800 kilos, she needs more uh, feed to maintain that body size compared to a cow that weighs uh, 600 kilos, and we will uh, then punish uh, the the big cow uh, because that feed that uh, that cow is eating is not used for anything. It is just a cost for the farmer. Everything else being equal. Then the second part that is the metabolic efficiency, and that is something that is related to the cow's uh, ability to. Uh, to transform uh, the feed and the energy that she takes in uh, into products such as pro uh, mainly milk production, but also uh, slaughter weight and also uh, fetus. So. These two components, they are uh, today weighted equally in the safe feed index, uh, and um, and that is the index that is a part of the the total merit index that we use, uh, and has been since uh, two thousand and nineteen. Uh, so the strategy that we have in uh, in Viking Genetics that is based on uh, these uh, statements here. We believe that full lactations are necessary, and they are necessary in all lactations. We need data uh, from early, mid and late lactation, and we also need data from uh, old cows because the, uh, the the data on old cows and the complexity around efficiency and, uh, and also health status and uh, feed intake related diseases, that is different in old cows than it is in young cows. We are in doubt that the research found data that we can uh, collect, uh, especially in the Nordic countries, if we if you just sat uh, on an island alone, uh, it will definitely not be enough. But also, given the the, the collaboration we can uh, we can be part of internationally, we still think that the research from data we have will not pro provide enough data for doing uh, a proper uh, evaluations. We also believe that the research farm approach is uh, too expensive. It's time consuming and it's also impractical in most commercial farms. Uh, we saw Tuesday a very uh, dedicated Canadian farmer uh, that is uh, an inspiration to watch him uh, with the fire in his eyes tell about how he has had the, both the grow safe and the incentic boxes in, him, is in, in his head, but he is not the average farmer. And, and I think it'll be difficult to find uh, many farmers around the world that we 
uh, eager to have uh, such uh, research farm equipment installed. And then something that in my personal mind is, is very important, that is that the data that we have uh, from normal production also needs is needed in order to do the documentation of what we're actually doing. So, so when we say that we select for improved efficiency, then we have to be able to document the effects in commercial farms. Uh, and if we don't have commercial farms with data, we will not be able to do that. So this is our strategy. And that's, of course, for debate, but that's uh, where we have ended and the reason why we have started to do the, the cattle feed intake system. The cattle feed intake system looks like this. So it's uh, cameras, 3D uh, cameras uh, that is mounted in the ceiling of the, of the farm. They are four and a half meters in the air. They are uh, 2.3 meters apart and they cover 2.5 meters on the ground. So that means that if a cow is standing uh, in the middle between two uh, cameras, then we can take uh, her left side from one camera and her right side from the other camera. And then we can actually uh, stitch these images together uh, so that we also have a perfect image of a cow where we, uh, where we have the data actually coming from two cameras. With the cameras hanging uh, in, in that height, then they are not disturbing the farmer uh, because uh, he doesn't have equipment that goes that uh, high in the air. It's not disturbing the cows. We don't have to, to tell the cow to walk uh, around these cameras or anything. We don't have to teach them to stand in specific positions. Uh, we can have the cows walking around as they have already done in the farm. And, and that, is, uh, that is, of course, uh, these uh, prerequisites is something that was very important when we started this project here. The status right now is that we have installations and agreements uh, with uh, 22 farmers around Denmark. Uh, because we are in Viking Nelix covering both red dairy cattle, Jersey and Holstein, then we also need data from these three breeds. And that means that uh, uh, we cannot make a breeding value for the Holstein population alone and then say, well, Jersey and red, they don't get any breeding values. So we are finding these farms and we're installing the equipment uh, in uh, those farms also so that we can do this uh, breeding value estimation. Right now, we have data from 3,500 uh, red cows, 4,000 Jersey and 5,000 Holstein cows. Uh, and uh, we continue to do installations over the next uh, two years or so. Uh, that also means that with that camera structure, uh, and the size of the herds we are in, we have more than 1700 cameras uh, collecting data 24 seven. That means that we collect more than uh, 90 million images per day. And those images are then generated into uh, 700,000 feet visits per day. And uh, those 700,000 feet visits per day, they generate a little more than 100,000 meals per day. And that is because we say that all feed visits uh, that are not um, feed visits that are not uh, uh, that are, are less than 15 minutes apart, they are still in within one meal. So if there's more than 15 minutes between two feed visits, then we say that a new meal has begun. Uh, but a cow can actually walk down uh, the aisle and and eat all the feed that she wants. Uh, from different positions, as long as they're not interrupted by a 15 minute break, then it's still a meal. The camera that we use, that is a camera that is called uh, a Kinect camera uh, from Microsoft. Uh, we have tested more than 20 different cameras, 3D cameras. And uh, for this setup, uh, the best uh, camera we can use, that is the Kinect camera from Microsoft. So it hangs four and a half meters in the air. If then uh, we use the time of flight, uh, uh, technology. So if the if the signal is sent out and it hits the surface where we know there's four and a half meter, then there's no feet lying there. But if it's returned uh, at four meters and twenty, then there's uh, thirty centimeters of feet lying uh, in that uh, pixel of the image. And then we can uh, we can cover the feet both uh, around and across the whole feet bunk, and then we know how much feet is lying uh, on the feet bunk uh, uh, every five seconds. Uh, when we uh, do the identification of the cow, what we do is that uh, when a cow has been milked, then she is leaving the milking parlor. Uh, in this situation here, it's a Jersey cow. Uh, she's uh, leaving the milking parlor uh, and uh, and we have a re ear tag reader that uh, reads the ear tag and says this is now cow number 750 or whatever. And then together with the ear tag reading, we also take an image of the back of the cow. 
and uh, here we take an RGB picture, so a red, green, blue uh, picture. We also take uh, the picture in the in the top right corner. That is the the depth picture. So these colors here they are indicating the distance from the camera uh, to the surface that is hit. So the colors here are uh, are essentially saying something about the distance between the camera uh, and the object. So um, with that, you can more or less see that there is a a, a curvature here that is a, a 3D contour of the back of the cow. Uh, we also collect an infrared image. So an infrared in, in an infrared image, uh, you can see, uh, for instance, scars in the skin of the cow from, uh, from uh, a disease or, or an accident or, and, and many other things. Uh, it, um, it also provides a lot of information that we can use uh, when the cows are then standing. In the two bottom pictures, you can see the cows are eating. So when we have enough of these reference pictures that we have collected together with the ear tech, then we can uh, use that and then say, if we have a cow that is uh, standing and eating and looking uh, very similar to the reference pictures, then we have uh, the ID of that cow. And that is done using an artificial intelligence algorithm, a mask RCNN model. Uh, first, we used a contour model, but it was not precise enough. Changing from this contour uh, PLS model into a mask RCNN model was a, a major uh, step forward for us, uh, both to uh, to do uh, the both to do the the identification, but also to have it done in all three breeds, both in red, in Jersey, and in Holstein cows. So the, the artificial intelligence algorithm uh, essentially takes all information out of the pictures and, and use that to predict uh, the cow, uh, the ID of the cow uh, based on the reference pictures. Uh, you can optimize all these things and that you can have a lot of discussion on how, how this should be done. This is uh, how we have chosen to do it uh, and it works uh, very well for us. If you go to the feed intake, uh, then this is an image that uh, represents how we estimate the feed intake from a visit. So um, we take a picture of the feed before the cow puts in her head, and then we take another picture when she takes out her head again. And then we subtract these two surfaces, uh, the surface of the feed from these two images from each other, and then uh, we get an image like this. So here, uh, the red uh, part, that is where the feed has gotten deeper. The blue part, that is where the feed has gotten higher. So the cow has not thrown up, but she has uh, taken some mouthfuls and then she has lost some of it or dropped some of it, uh, or she has pushed in the feet to find something of the good stuff that is probably lying closer to the uh, surface of the feeding table. But in this case here, she has removed 14.4 liters. She has added 10.8 liters. So in total, she has removed uh, 3.6 liters. And, and then we uh, sum this up for visits uh, over a full day and from that, we quantify the amount of feed that a cow is eating through a day. We've done a validation study of this together with Aarhus University, where we put, uh, uh, you can see the setup uh, on the right side here, uh, that we put up uh, scale measures uh, below these uh, eating bins. And uh, then we had a camera mounted uh, on top of each of, each of these scales. Uh, we, um, we, we then uh, challenged the system with four different diets either full maize silage or full grass silage, and then we combine that with the crushed barley or with the dried beetroot. Uh, and of course, uh, the the challenge of this is the density. The density is much uh, higher in the maize silage than it is in the grass silage. Uh, and, and that challenge was then performed in a Latin square design with 48 Holstein cows that went through this, uh, through this system. And uh, the results from that uh, showed that um, with all combinations of uh, grass silage and maize silage with the beetroot and the uh, and, uh, and the barley, uh, we were able to get uh, correlations of more than 0.9 between the what we measured with the scale and what we measured uh, with the uh, cameras. So we are uh, very happy uh, with these results here. For the body weight, uh, I show you results from Jersey, but you could also um, I could have shown the same for Holsteins. It's, it's essentially the same approach, and it's also a very similar results. Uh, what we do was that we we had a a, a walking scale uh, mounted in the floor when the cow is leaving the milking parlor, uh, together with the images that we take uh, of this, where we make the reference pictures and and uh, also uh, collect information of the ear tech. 
uh, and and then we save these images uh, and then we take the information out uh, in order to do a, a PLS model. So what we do is that we find the highest point of the cow all the way uh, from the neck to the tail and that is the spine of the cow and then we say how far left and right should you go to drop 3, 5, 10 and 15 centimeters and then we use that information uh, in a PLS model to see how well can we then take uh, the, the most informative points of the back of the cow and then how well can we then uh, predict uh, the body weight. And uh, we have taken out uh, 12 uh, points out of these uh, 400 contour variables uh, and, uh, and with those uh, we are able to uh, make a very, very good prediction. And this is what you see here where we have uh, plotted the observed versus the predicted uh, body weight and we find an R square of uh, point, uh, uh, nine six uh, between uh, the observed and the predicted. So, so we believe that we do uh, very well. What we have done, I have not shown. I will not show this here either. But, but we have uh, because how can you kind of follow up on this? Uh, because we we have only mounted this in in two Jersey Hertz, two Holstein, and two uh, Red Hertz, and um, and that data. Are we sure that that is representative of, of what is happening in the next Holstein Hertz and in the next Red and the next Jersey Hertz? But what we do is that we follow some slaughter weight data uh, where we take the, the latest uh, images of the back of the cow uh, before the cow is slaughtered. And then we compare uh, those, prediction, uh, those predictions uh, with the, the information we get from the, from the slaughterhouse. And there we get uh, also R squares of 0 0.94, 0 0.95 and, and so. So, uh, so it's kind of, uh, it's, it's rather a convincing results we have on the body weight. And we have one of the herds where we have had uh, measurements for a long time, and this is the first example of data we show for the farmer. Uh, here we have a cow, the blue line is uh, for the first lactation, the red is for second, uh, yellow is for third, and then the green is for her first la fourth lactation. And now you can start to see how the body uh, weight curves uh, look uh, throughout lactation. You can see that uh, in this third lactation, it looks like the, the bottom of the, the curve is later than it is in, in second and first lactation. Um, so it gets more and more informative now for the farmer, uh, and we provide him with information on how the current weight is, what it weight was at calving, uh, et cetera, uh, for this uh, farmer head and for this specific cow. Uh, we, we also provide uh, some management uh, numbers for the cow, no, for the farmer, uh, for, for the full herd. So here we show the farmer, and this is, uh, I believe, is a, a Jersey herd, uh, where we show uh, in the top left corner, we show how much feed was put out uh, for the cows uh, when you started the day, and then how is it taken away uh, during the day. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, around uh, one o'clock in the afternoon and around uh, six o'clock in the, or seven o'clock in the, in the evening, it looks like uh, it's, it's empty. Uh, and again here at four o'clock in the morning, it's empty, and that's that's also where you see that there is a flat part of, um, as there is a flat part on the feed intake curve, and that is because the cows are getting milked. Uh, if you then go to the to the bottom uh, left uh, corner, you can see here the number of cows that are uh, eating uh, at specific time points of the day. The blue is the current day or the the day we look into here, and then the gray that is the average for the same time point in the in the previous uh, seven days. So what you can see if you look into around one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, there it's empty, so no cow is there because they are getting milked. So when they are standing there waiting for the milking, uh, what uh, what is the consequence of that? That is that they get tired and they get hungry. So after the milking, they go to eat. So you see a top right after the the milking and then you also uh, see it's not so uh, it's 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 easier to see at nine o'clock in the morning that there is also a bottom here now so so after they have eaten they choose to go to 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 rest uh, and and that is very much the case we see that after the milking the cows they go to eat and after that they go to relax so it's almost it can be almost empty uh, one hour after after milking because the cows then go to rest and I think this is a health sign of the farm uh, this is what the farmer actually wants. He doesn't want the cow to go and lay down after milking because that increases the, the, the health issues and especially other health issues. Uh, so that is really what, uh, what he wants to do. On the top right corner, you see how much feed is given to the cows and then how much uh, residual feed is, uh, is at the end of the day. 
uh, and in the bottom, uh, of course, the farmer can can use that information to uh, pre-correct the feed intake on the on the following day. If the residual feed is too high, uh, then uh, then he should uh, he should uh, probably uh, slow down on the feeding the the the, the day after. Uh, but uh, there can be all kinds of reasons why these uh, numbers are are high or low. And in the bottom, you see the amount of feed that the cows are eating here. They are around 55 kilos per day, and that is what we expect from a Jersey cow, uh, at least in, in Denmark. What we really want to do, these numbers here, they are in, in, uh, in kilos and euros. I hope it's OK. Uh, but we, what we really want to do is to work a lot more with the economy of the farmer. Uh, uh, and, and what we have shown here is in the first 11 hertz, uh, we, uh, we have um, made some numbers on how many kilos of dry matter a cow is eating on average in the herd per year. How is, uh, what is the, the yield production uh, per, in energy corrected milk per cow uh, through a year? Uh, and if we have that information, we're actually able to predict uh, the methane, uh, at least the Danish national reporting for IPCC, that is uh, solely based on uh, intake uh, in kilos of dry matter. So we are actually able to say uh, how much uh, methane a cow is producing based on the, the, the reporting we use for national reporting for IPCC should also be OK to use uh, on a cow level uh, on a Danish cow. So so we, we can also point at those that have the highest uh, methane production and the lowest methane production. On average, the contribution margin, uh, very simplified contribution margin here uh, using uh, 33 euro cents per kilo of energy corrected milk and 20 euro cents for a kilo of dry matter. You can see that that there are some. Uh, uh, well, on average, uh, these numbers here look uh, what as we expect from a Danish production circumstances. What you what you can see is that if you look at the cow in the herd with the lowest contribution margin and compare that to the cow with the highest contribution margin, there is substantial difference on how much money a farmer is making on his most efficient and his least efficient cow uh, in the herd. So this is uh, this is really an eye opener for the farmer when they see these results, uh, and it's something that is is quite helpful for them also in the reproduction no in uh, replacement strategies uh, on farm. So now I'll try and, uh, and and guide you through some of the management tools that we uh, present for the farmers with the data that we have. Uh, what we want to say is something about feed intake at the different uh, different uh, yield levels, and uh, we have uh, we, we we try to uh, we try to to do that um, um, at some uh, some uh, amounts of feed uh, at specific uh, uh, parts of the lactation. And now I can see I've done something. Uh, this is. Uh, this here is uh, this is Danish and it means calving and uh, the golden out here that means the dry off. So uh, what we what we present for the farmer that is the amount of feed that a cow has been eating for the first 30 days to give an indication on how well has the cow started after uh, calving. We also provide information on uh, how much she has eaten uh, total after 50 days because that is where the farmer takes the in a decision if the cow should be inseminated to have a new calf. We do it after 100 days because some farmers work with the prolonged lactation and uh, and that is a good time point for them to get that information. Uh, how much has she eaten after 100 days? Are we willing to to work with prolonged lactation for this cow? And then we have this uh, classic benchmarking after 305 days because that's also how we kind of do the production uh, summation and and uh, and that is a, a good uh, time point to uh, for the farmer to to know um, uh, to know how much uh, the feed has uh, feed intake has been for 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 these cows uh, together with the production level. Uh, but of course, if he wants to do a replacement strategy, uh, then what kind of information does he need then? Because if he gets the information on uh, on on um, if he gets the information at 305 days, then it's too late. So he he then he has already lost 305 days of of feeding for this cow. So he has to take the decision earlier uh, in order to get uh, real value for this. Here I have some uh, some examples of this from uh, six of the Holstein herds. This is uh, this is after uh, 100 days in milk. We have taken uh, some of the cow, or we have taken the cows that was at 100 days in milk, and they had a, an average production of 50, 45, 50, 50, 50, and 55 kilos uh, as an average daily yield uh, after 100 days. And then we look into what is then the difference between the cow that has eaten the most and the least feed. 
Uh, and here you can see that you have up to uh, 1,500, 1,800 kilos of feet in different. So that's 18 kilos of feet per day. And with a dry matter percentage of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 40, uh, then it, it gets into a lot of kilos of dry matter that you have uh, as a difference between the most and the least efficient. But these numbers here is actually uh, very uh, corresponding to what you see on uh, research farm data. If then, uh, because then uh, it's very easy to say, okay, but then what about the body weight? Is that just coming from a cow that is big versus a cow that is small? But body weight, because feed and feed and, and production, that is easy to sum over 305 days, but body weight is more difficult to sum over, over a full lactation. But what we have done here is that we have taken from a Jersey herd, we have taken eight cows, two in first lactation, two in second lactation, two in third lactation, two in fourth lactation. And then we have found cows that more or less had the same uh, 305 days uh, production, the first group of around 10,000 kilos, 10,400, 11,200 and 11,500 11, um, kilos of energy corrected milk. So, so of course, two first lactation cows are not necessarily the same size, but they are close to the same size, I would uh, assume. And what you see still here with the same production level, there is substantial difference in how much uh, feed the cow is eating uh, in these uh, 305 days. And, and that effect uh, transferred directly into the contribution margin. So, so you have uh, two to 500 uh, euros in difference in how much money you make uh, on cows that has more or less the same size and more or less the same production because there is so substantial differences in how much the cow is eating. If you go to the weight data, then uh, I have uh, I've made these uh, three uh, handwritten uh, body weight curves for let's say it's the first it's the same cow that is going through first lactation, second lactation, and third lactation, and then she'll have these uh, uh, body weight profiles. So she would uh, she would carve in and a specific uh, body size. She would drop some body weight uh, and then gain it again in the late part of lactation, and then she will be dried off. Uh, and then we will not measure her body weight uh, with this system here, but then we will measure her body weight again after she gives birth to a calf. And again, the same will happen. She will lose body weight. She will have a flat part where she is not changing her body weight, and then she'll gain body weight again to get right off and give birth to a new calf, uh, etc. So if we have this data, and we have that in this system here, then we're able to say something about uh, body weight development in early lactation, we can say something about what is the body weight in week seven and compare that to the body weight in week one. And then we can say how much have the cows uh, dropped in uh, in body weight. We can say something about weight development in the, in the dry period because we know what she weighed in the last week before she was dried off and we know what she weighted in the first week after calving. And then we can say something about how the body weight development was in the dry period. We can also say something about how many days from calving uh, is a cow uh, when she reaches her minimum weight, because that uh, is when she will be able to uh, to get pregnant again. If she is in negative energy balance, she will not be able to uh, to uh, to maintain a fetus, uh, and and uh, and that is an important information for the farmer. And then also, this is a specific information uh, needed from from cows with robot, uh, from farmers with robots, because cows that are in late lactation, uh, that is not uh, producing too much energy corrected milk, but is still, uh, you still we need them to go to the robot, and in order to go to the robot, they need uh, some concentrate, and if you get this all this concentrate together with some high energy. Uh, uh, mixed ration at the feeding table, they tend to get too fat. Uh, and if they get too fat and they don't pro produce enough milk, then you might be willing to dry them off earlier than you were planning to do due to your, uh, yeah, how the plan looked like, but uh, you, you will you'll dry them off a little bit earlier so that they don't get too fat because a fat cow is going into a drier period. That is, uh, that is, not, uh, that is not good. So if you look into the information from the dry period, how, how is the cows changing in the dry period? Then uh, what we see is that the cows that we have going from first lactation uh, to second lactation, uh, they lose about uh, 10 to 15 kilos. Uh, and those going from second lactation to third lactation, they lose about 30 kilos. What, what we need to, to uh, and, and what the farmers want is uh, that the cows do not lose weight. So this number should be closer to zero. What we do not correct for here, that is how big the fetus is when they dry off. It's not a full fetus. The, the majority of the fetus will come in the dry period, 
but there is some features and there is also some uh, some fluids uh, uh, related to the features uh, that we do not correct for here. So some of, of these negative numbers come from that. Um, but you can see that there's limited, uh, there's limited variation uh, between the three breeds. But if you go into, into breed specific information, then what you can see here is that there is substantial uh, differences between the herds uh, within the breed. So these are from the six first uh, red herds where we have uh, installed the equipment. Uh, and and uh, so the reason why there is just a minus at the first or second lactation for uh, herd five, that is that we do not measure uh, those uh, cows uh, uh, currently uh, in that herd, uh, but we will in the future. But uh, herd number two, it's actually a herd where uh, he is well aware that the cows are losing too much uh, body weight in the dry period. And uh, he is also, um, what the consequence of that is that he's lying very high in uh, in uh, in death rate actually. Uh, for the cows, he's uh, plus 6%, where the average for red cows in Denmark is around 2 and what he has done uh, lately is that he has, uh, he has changed focus into this dry period uh, feeding, and now he has actually uh, we can see in the curves that that he is up uh, around minus uh, five to minus ten kilos uh, in the body weight change in the dry period. But it takes time to to change these things here. Uh, but this is information that is very useful for the farmer uh, in order to do something about uh, the dry period. It's a period where, at least in Denmark, you you tend to kind of more or less forget about these cows. But it is uh, it, it's not a holiday to be a dry cow. But it's kind of where you you kind of uh, reboost in order to to perform in the following lactation. And if that period is not handled well, well, you will run into trouble in the following uh, lactation. So it's very important for the farmer to 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 focus on this. If you look into body weight change in early lactation, again, you can see that the variation between uh, breeds are not that big. We lose about uh, 10, 15, 20 kilos in the first seven weeks after calving. We would have expected this number to be a little bit higher, uh, but but it's not. Um, uh, but that's something we can discuss. But again, the variation is not that big between the breeds, but it's actually quite uh, substantial differences uh, between herds within breed. And what you can see here uh, for herd number four, uh, when we saw these numbers here, we, we asked the farmer if he had some issues with the cows that if they were losing too much weight, uh, we could see that they were losing more weight uh, than the average Jersey uh, uh, first lactation cows uh, in other herds. And uh, and when he got this information, he he went home and changed uh, some uh, uh, some of the information in, in, in his uh, diet uh, for the cows. And, uh, and uh, now he is actually, he has changed uh, this curve so that he's also lying on these minus uh, five to minus 10 kilos in body weight change in early lactation. And he says that the cows, they are performing better, higher production, uh, better health, uh, et cetera. So again, in, uh, an uh, example where we have helped the farmer to, to change uh, management uh, into a better production. Uh, minimum weight after calving. So how many days does, uh, does it take for a cow to get into positive energy? Oh, sorry. To get into positive energy balance, and what we can see again is that uh, there is uh, not uh, there's not uh, that much uh, difference uh, between um, uh, between the breeds. But what we can see again is that there is bigger differences uh, between the herds uh, within breed. Um, so now I have this is uh, yeah. A little bit about methane also. Uh, I'll not show any results on methane. I'll just show this figure here because that is also one of the arguments we have with the CFID system. Uh, this is uh, some uh, some results. Uh, uh, a former PhD student of mine, uh, Larissa Setoni, presented uh, some years ago uh, from the research farm where we have a kind of an, uh, an animal solution for dry matter intake. So uh, it is uh, corrected. It's the dry matter intake corrected for uh, for the mean, lactation number, uh, days in milk, and so on, and the same for methane production. And what you can see is that uh, we see a linear relationship between the dry matter intake and the methane production. Uh, so if we can improve uh, the efficiency, if we can have the same production for a lower uh, feed intake, we should also be able to have a lower methane production. And that is, of course, something that uh, we are very interested in doing. I'll show some uh, initial results on uh, some of the first results we have on uh, uh, on genetic parameters. That is uh, Coralia manchinella pets that has done these uh, 
these analysis. Uh, so, uh, so this is a presentation of the farm uh, data that we have. Uh, we have uh, seven Holstein herds with uh, between 230 and 720 cows. Uh, we have uh, data from four Jersey herds in this uh, study here from 270 to 430 cows. And then we have uh, six red herds with 225 to close to 500 cows uh, in these herds here. So uh, 2,700 uh, Holsteins, 1,400 jerseys, and around 2,000 red cows, where uh, the vast majority of the animals have uh, been uh, genotyped uh, with various uh, panels of uh, SNPs. Uh, the, the means are shown here. For dry mat intake, we are 23 for jersey, 27 for, uh, for the Holstein and the red uh, cows, uh, going from uh, 9, uh, 13 and 15 uh, as a minimum up to over 40 for Holstein, 34 for Jersey and 38 uh, for the uh, for the red cows. For body weight, the, the Holstein cows is around uh, 680 kilos. Uh, the Jersey cows are at 460 kilos and the red cows a little bit smaller than the Holstein, 640 kilos. These are also kind of numbers we, we, we see uh, from other studies on, on these uh, three breeds here. Uh, I'll not go into the model uh, specifically, but just say that uh, the heritability estimates for the for the CFIT data says uh, heritability is around 0.23 for dry matter intake and around uh, 0.50 for uh, for body weight. So uh, the limitation of this type of kind of data here is that that when we initiate the data and the data collection, will then be initiated at the specific time point where the the cows are. So we have bits and pieces of lactation here and there. Uh, some cows, they will have, uh, we will start to measure when they're 100 days in milk, so we don't have the first 100 days. Uh, and, and then they will start a new lactation, and then we will have some data on second lactation where we don't have a full first lactation, et cetera. So, so it, is, uh, it is initial results. We, we hope that we'll have higher heritabilities in the future, uh, but, uh, but we can only be patient here and, and, uh, and see if, if that is also the case. So. To sum up, uh, the CFIT system uh, is something that we continue to develop, both for management and for genetic analysis. There are still tons of things to do, uh, both to improve the system, uh, but also uh, in ways we can use the data. Uh, and uh, I, it, it'll be a, it'll be a big uh, uh, journey to be on, and and it's uh, it's something that I really look forward to. Uh, the Weight and the feed intake data that we have based on these three D cameras that is heritable, and uh, and we continue also to to look into new ways of analyzing the data uh, and and also to collect more data to increase the accuracy of the estimates we come up with. We use the data for from CFIT to do uh, management purposes on farm. That is the the main way we can. Um, we can make this system attractive for the farmer. That is to give him uh, management decision tools uh, that he can use in his everyday life. The better he can use the data, the better the data will be, and the better the genetic evaluation will also be. So it's a win-win uh, situation if we can use the data for management. And then we still need more data. I think that's kind of all genetics uh, people. They say that we need more data. Uh, of course, we only need it if it's uh, if it's good data. So we still need to improve it. We can only use the data if we have validated the system, and we continue to do that uh, in order to make uh, this uh, a good way to uh, handle uh, data from commercial farms uh, to be used in analysis uh, for genetics. Thank you very much. I'll stop here, and then I'll take any questions. I hope you have a lot of good questions for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice. Thank you. Uh, and and if anyone has questions, you can raise your hands, turn on your cameras and microphones. So yeah, I was I was here wondering when you were talking about the data collection part that the camera capture everything, and. I was wondering, the data is processed uh, in, a, in a central place where all the data is processed, or the farmer needs to have a, a computer or something like this in the farm to process yeah. this? Really good question. Uh, and um, I can say that uh, there is a, uh, there is a huge server 
on farm that is doing the 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 real analysis. So that is done on farm, and then all the data is then transferred uh, to a central database where we can access the data. But some of this analysis is actually also done within each camera. So there is a, there is a, a small uh, computer attached to each camera, and that camera uh, can do the the first pre-processing of the data um, of the data um, so that it's used usable for the analysis. So we don't store all the images because if we did that, we would run out of space uh, within a few days. Uh, we do record uh, and save all the visits. Uh, we also uh, continue to uh, to take all the images that we get from the uh, from the references. We also store them historically, also because that is kind of a way where we could we could look into new phenotypes uh, that we might be able to to predict uh, from the images of the back of the cow. Uh, and if we have those historically, we can also uh, predict them historically. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, he answered. Um, okay, but in, so the the computer that the farmer has on the on the farm will delete these images in a like in a period of time because you guys have the backup. Yeah. So so for instance, we have done some uh, we, all the validation studies that we have done. For instance, for the identification and so on, there we have had a a, a huge uh, hard drive where we have stored all the data. So we have uh, I don't know, let's say ten. Uh, 10 uh, six weeks period where we have all data and okay. that data that is something we can look back into and say uh, we know that data uh, we can uh, we can improve our algorithms based on that it's uh, the the feed intake algorithm is not perfect uh, yet and i don't perfect what is perfect but it it's still something that we can improve and given that we have such uh, validation data, that is something that we can use to improve the the, the data. So one thing that we are, we are often question about that is, um, what do you do with two cows standing next to each other, and uh, and sharing kind of the same feed? They can take bits and pieces here and there, and um, that is the that is how uh, that is how the, the the life is in a farm. Uh, that's the same if if I'm together with uh, with four friends and we have to uh, share a, a bowl of uh, mixed candy, then there's something that I prefer over my friends and I want that uh, over my friends, and that's the same with the cows, and uh, and that's something uh, that's something that's some of these behavioral traits that is difficult to measure, also very difficult to measure with the incentive boxes, because there the cow very soon find out that she is the only or perhaps to share it with 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 one other cow. We can see it in some of the validation studies that we have done uh, where we have single cows that are eating. Uh, then uh, the behavior on how they eat is very, very different from what you see if they're standing uh, with 100 other cows where they have to share the same feed. OK, Flavio can go. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Ian. Really, really nice presentation. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, so, in terms of uh, the cost, if you compare the, all the, the what you need with the cameras, the computer uh, in a bar, how you would compare with the cost of having the traditional, for instance, Incentec beans and, and the, the weights to, to measure the, the scales to measure the weight? Yeah. So, uh, can you give us an idea of, of uh, cost? Yeah. Um, so so uh, I, I have asked uh, you. Uh, you have also asked these questions before, and 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 I'll st still a little bit of a fluffy answer, because I think. Uh, I think that the, I think it's cheaper uh, than what you see with the with with the the scale based systems. Uh, one of the challenges is that that if we 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 are Viking genetics, we cannot, we are not uh, we are not Lely or De Laval or, or some big company that can go or, or a gear whatever they called. Uh, so so there is a big punt between uh, between Denmark and Canada, and if we go 
uh, to North America and we want to go to North America to install it, then then our cost to uh, to uh, to start up in North America, that is something that we we don't have experience in that, uh, and it's something that will be uh, pricey, uh, and uh, and therefore we will have a cost extra on on that part here, uh, but still, I believe that the cost will be lower uh, than what you will see uh, from the incentive boxes. Um, and then I also have to say that I I am not the commercial part of this here. I I mainly do the do the scientific part of it. Uh, I I see the prices that we are working with uh, is is lower than what you see for uh, for the incentive boxes. There's also something about how how do we do maintenance? Because uh, of course we we have uh, uh, dust and uh, spider webs and flies and so on. Uh, we can we can uh, we have good uh, tools to uh, to follow that, uh, but we need uh, people also to then respond to that and clean the camera lenses and so on. And again, how do we set up that uh, in a new country where we install? I don't know. Let's say we install uh, four installations in Canada. Then how do we do that maintenance part? So I think some of these things here that will influence it. Uh, should we have a local po uh, person that? That can uh, take care of it. Should we have? Uh, should we uh, rely on the farmer to do it himself or, or herself, uh, and things like that? Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyone has questions, Dr. Larson? I can. Uh, I can also say that I come to. Uh, I come to ADSA in Ottawa, so we can uh, continue the discussion there, also on the prices and so on. I might be wiser at that point. <laughs> okay, Lucas, if you have questions. We cannot hear you. Still no. Still no. <laughs> yeah, just type on the chat and we can read it, your question. Okay, uh, anyone else while we wait Lucas to type his question? Oh, it is a very nice technology. Uh, be able to yeah. have all these measurements and don't have to worry about manage the animals. Um, well, I can uh, so I can say uh, just to to to. Uh, I can say that we have um, we have worked a lot with uh, with the head detection. Because uh, one of the things that we have uh, that has been critical for us that is to measure to identify the cows based on the back of the cow, but the back of the cow is is standing relatively in the same position, whereas the head is moving a lot, and the, at the head you have the ears and they are moving even more. So so cutting out the the head of the image that is something that has been quite critical and something that uh, that has. Uh, the, the the way we have handled that has improved also the algorithm quite substantial and then also we have worked a lot with um, with how to uh, take uh, what can you say uh, events into account in a more optimized way uh, so if the farmer has a visit from uh, some friends or some colleagues if uh, if there's a dog walking around if there's a tractor walk uh, driving down the corridor etc then, uh, then that has to be taken into account, so it's not measured as as feet, uh, but it should be measured as an event that is not related to the to the farming or to the feed intake. So, so that optimization of that has been uh, a, a big help. And then we have also uh, uh, we 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 go away from because we can see the farmer. If you ask a farmer when when he's feeding the cows, he would say that it's at a very specific time every day, and it's plus minus five minutes. But we can just see that that is not the case. Uh, there is uh, substantial differences in when they feed the cows, and no matter uh, what they say, then the, the the fact is here that we actually have images uh, that tells us with a timestamp that tells us when the tractor is, is giving the feed to the cows, and it's very hard to argue against that. Uh, and and therefore we have actually changed it so that we don't have this fixed window where the where the feeding uh, should start, but we have made it more. Uh, automated that we find this uh, this time slot where the feed is given to the cow, so it's more, yeah, more optimized and more flexible than than the rigid system we had before. 
No, you are muted. Sorry. Sorry. So we have uh, Lucas' questions. So my question was how the cameras identify the left, right halves of the cows. Ear yeah. tag, RFID. Yeah. Um, Uh, I'll just uh, two seconds. So I share this image here now. Now you can actually see this this example down here that that kind of, of tells the story. This cow out here, she is standing on the edge of the of the image. You can also see it both with the RGB picture, but also with the depth picture. So we don't get a full picture of this here. So we don't have any good reference to do do that. But you should imagine that you have a picture next to this picture here that is actually um, overlapping with with this image here so on the on the this is taken from one camera but right next to this one here there's another camera that is uh, that is taking this specific cow here uh, from the other side so in the next picture she will stand in this side of the image so all these images here they have been uh, they have been uh, uh, calibrated in all three dimensions so that we can stitch the images together. So there, in this overlap, you can actually uh, you are actually able to um, you're actually able to uh, uh, to have a full picture of uh, one cow that is standing on the edge of two images because they are calibrated in all three dimensions. Uh, we do that with this one line. We have this one line uh, uh, kind of a uh, I don't I don't know the English terms, but it's it's kind of you know um, if you have a big truck, uh, then you can kind of uh, fix uh, the all the things that you have on the truck. You can fix that with this very uh, this click system, uh, and we have one there one one string that is uh, 230 meters long, so that fits with one big uh, one big uh, barn, and that one is level we can make that level from one end of the barn to the other end of the barn and then we know when we have that string we can say we can actually make this calibration throughout the full stable because all this equipment that you you see in a stable that the farmer say oh this is in level none of it is in level so we need to make our own uh, things here that that makes it in level then we actually what we do in order to to do this calibration from the beginning is that we actually put uh, what we call an artificial cow uh, in the image, uh, so we have this uh, this uh, metal box that is kind of shaped ish like a cow, uh, and then we use that to do this calibration so that we are sure that we stitch the images uh, uh, in the right uh, way. Okay, I hope this asked you, uh, answered your question, Lucas. Um, I just have a, a last question. If Oh, Lucas has a follow up question. Uh, is the calibration also part of the maintenance of the cameras? Uh, yes, uh, if necessary. And it's also it's something that we are automizing so that uh, the pictures I showed just before, you had a lot of feet and there was also cows, but you also have uh, time points of the day when you have images where you have an empty feeding table and you have no cows in the image. And if you have those cameras, those, those uh, situations, we can actually take that image and then use that to recalibrate the empty floor. And we can do that uh, when it's needed. We can also automate it, automize it. Uh, sometimes we see that the residual feed that is uh, uh, reported on farm is a little bit higher than what the farmer is uh, is expecting, and when that is the case, uh, then we we go in and do a recalibration. Uh, sometimes of the existing uh, pictures, but also sometimes we we sit then and and automize it so that we get images we can use to recalibrate the floor and also stitch them together again. Okay, uh, so Kristen also has a question. Um, can the cameras be used in other types of commercial systems like beef cattle? Um, so uh, um, the, the answer to that is probably yes, uh, but uh, so um, the, the backbone in our system here, that is that we, we are able to uh, read the ear tag in a corridor where cows are walking through one by one and take images of those in order to refine the cows when they are at the feeding table or in the barn or whatever you want to put up the cameras. And um, my uh, 
my gut feeling says that it's difficult for uh, it's diff difficult um, to find beef stations where you you handle those uh, beef animals every day and force them through one narrow corridor. If you do that for all the animals that you want to measure on, then I would say then I, my best guess is that yes, it is possible. The next challenge is that um, a dairy cow, of course, she loses weight and she gains weight again, but it's 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 um, it's not the same because she kind of come back to some sort of of where she was at some point earlier on. So, a beef cow, a beef uh, bull, or whatever is always growing. So that means that the reference images we 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 need to do another an, another type of, of of optimization of the images we use to refine the cow because the cow the calf is always growing. So so uh, older images cannot be used. Uh, a calf that is 100 days old cannot be used to predict a calf that is 150 days old. I, my best guess would be because the calf has gained so much weight in that period. But um, we we are not uh, we we haven't done any dedicated work on on beef or on heifers or on growing animals yet. Uh, but um, I, I cannot I can so I cannot say that it works. But if you have a situation where you force the animals through a corridor one by one. Then my best guess is that it would work, but we would need to work on the validation of that. And then, if it's Angus, black Angus, then um, color black is it could be an issue because the black, these images, the depth images. If you have black uh, cows, then you don't necessarily get a good response uh, from the from the depth picture because uh, it absorbs the signal from the, the from the three D camera. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we are all, also already on the time, but I'd yep. like to thank you for your uh, talk today. Uh, do you have another question, Flavio? Yeah, I, I have a last question that I can oh, Okay. <laughs> I need to know what, why Pittsburgh is Steelers. Oh yeah, sure. Oh, that's a <laughs> Pittsburgh. Okay, yeah, that's a. How long? How long do you have? <laughs> so oh, so I can I, the short story is that uh, I watched American football with some friends uh, more than 20 years ago and at that time uh, that time uh, they had a running back called Jerome Bettis uh, he was called the bus and I didn't pay attention to any uh, any football but but that guy the bus he was uh, kind of my size uh, so uh, a little too heavy uh, but 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 he could run through a tackle uh, and have five people on his back and still continue to run, and that fascinated me. And then I can I started to uh, I started to uh, to cheer for them. I have actually, I've been to the I've been to Heinz Field, seen a, a, a one game, and I've also been in London to see them. So, yeah. Oh okay. Yeah yeah. Now I ask it because my, my son he loves the Steelers. Yeah, of course he does. Yeah, yeah. Everybody at heart, we all love the Steelers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. That was a good question, Thank Flavio. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, be yeah. the best one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks good. a lot. Yeah, well, have really a good day. It. I'll go and have yeah. dinner now with my wife, and then I wish you a good day and a good weekend when you come to that. Thank you. A have a nice Thank dinner. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.